Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, be introducing our speaker this afternoon, um, Mary Cummings from, the Mass from MIT. Uh, she received her BS in mathematics from the Naval Academy in 1988, an MS in space systems engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School, and a PhD in systems engineering from Virginia. Uh, she's been a naval officer and military pilot for about 12 years. Uh, one of the first uh, Navy female fighter pilots. And she's now an associate professor in aeronautics and astronautics department at MIT and director of the MIT Humans and Automation Laboratory. She's also on the National Academy of Sciences uh, Committee on Human Systems Integration, where I have uh, been uh, working with her. And we're very glad that she's taken time out. She's been here visiting Boeing, and she's taken time out to come here and give a talk, an overview of what's going on in her laboratory. So thank oh, you. Super. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I am going to give a talk about just a, a really one project in specifically. I'm a, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other things my lab does. And if you have some questions, any along the way, it's a small group. Um, so just stop me, and, and we'll go on. I always wonder when I introduce my lab, the Humans and Automation Lab, it's actually a demographic uh, test because there's, uh, the younger that you are, the least likely you are to get the joke behind the name of my lab. So there are a few people in here that might not understand the joke behind the name of my lab. So you'll have to ask the older people later uh, what the joke is. You know you're dating yourself when you have to, people have to look it up to find out why your lab name is so funny. So uh, as you heard from Jonathan, I do have a, a, a different background than most academics. I actually spent the first, I, well, I went to the Naval Academy, so four years, and then 10 years after that flying, so uh, with the Navy. And I flew A4s up here and F-18s. So that actually is what led me to go down this path of doing human in the loop, humans and automation research. I spent a lot of time complaining about who was the idiot that designed the, um, whatever uh, cockpit that I was in at the time, they've never been, uh, there's never been a great design uh, because they were always the last things that were designed. And so I'm hoping at a place like Microsoft, I don't have to explain to you why it's important to keep the user in the loop, although uh, in the military establishment, that can actually still be a new, a new uh, thought, particularly for UAVs, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So this is what, when people ask me, what do I do? I, my research is, I, it falls under a general umbrella called human factors engineering, um, but it's actually a little bit more specific. Human factors can be a really broad range of topics of anywhere where the human fits into any system. But I'm really looking more at the interlink between humans and automation, something called human supervisory control, where you have an operator here doing some kind of remote task here that's mediated by a computer in the middle. We've got some actuators that are actually doing the task, some sensors that are giving you some feedback, uh, maybe some data fusion going on here. And the operator basically sees the world through the displays and has to use some set of controls to affect change. So this brings up a whole new set of problems when you've got people at a remote distance with limited information, or actually lots of information in some cases, but not a good way to organize the information and how do they actually go and do these complex tasks that in a lot of areas that I focus in are time pressured high risk domains. That does equal the military. I do, I do do a lot of military research in my lab. Although interestingly, it's uh, starting to be overshadowed by the research that I'm doing for the energy environment. So for example, nuclear process, we're working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I'm working with a company called Enel out of Italy who is trying to come, become the world dominant power in um, exporting nuclear energy across Europe, for example. Uh, we're working with other uh, process control companies. And so it's on a large scale with the focus on increasing energy, people have understood that there's a human role in controlling and monitoring those processes. And certainly in the BP spill recently, we, we definitely can see the, um, how the 
some problems with human control can, can lead to catastrophic problems. So uh, that's been a big source of what we're doing. But we also do get to do fun things, like we're working with a company in France called Alstom to do some display, some new head-up display designs for high-speed rail. So that's kind of cool. I get asked a lot to say, oh, we want the cool, sexy fighter pilot stuff in whatever technology du jour. And um, it's great because it, it, it can help bring in business, but generally, nine out of 10 times, the answer is you don't want to design your system for a fighter pilot. That's not the kind of person you want controlling your system. And there's a whole set of other issues that go along with uh, making sure that you can kind of keep your human from, from doing too much damage inside of a system. But everywhere that I look at in my research, I've got a lot of significant embedded autonomy. Sometimes that means artificial intelligence, whatever we want to define that as. Uh, but there's lots of algorithms going uh, underneath the hood of all the technologies that I'm working on. And I concentrate on individuals controlling some technologies in small teams. I leave the large teams of people controlling large processes to people with in, uh, industrial and organizational psychology backgrounds. And feel free, I'm not scary, I'm not scary. You can ask me questions any long, any, any time, so. We do do a lot of work in unmanned vehicles, and so um, because that's kind of one of the cool things that we've got uh, being shown right now, uh, be working on the lab right now, I thought I'd focus in on that. But again, most of the ideas that I'm talking about here are generalizable to other domains, particularly things like first responder domains, air traffic control. There's a lot of other large complex systems that have, the similar, have similar parameters. So this is the way that unmanned vehicles, particularly UAVs, are flown right now in the military. Some UAV, this is a shadow, it's a medium size. There's a Predator that's a little bit bigger than that, and then a Global Hawk, which is much bigger than that. But in all cases, they're flown from these like trailer-like environments where they have at least two people, if not more people, inside this ground control station. Typically, one person is managing the camera, so kind of because all the missions for right now are typically intelligence missions. Every now and then they close the loop and, and fire some weapons from uh, a UAV platform. But for far and away, the most use of them is basically getting pictures. And, uh, and then they've got a pilot who, and then the Air Force, the Air Force insists that a rated commercial pilot, like I um, am, and used, well, I'm a commercial, still have a commercial rating, not no longer military pilot, but you actually, have to have somebody with a, a certified FAA uh, license in the seat, although the Army doesn't do that. The Army actually lets enlisted people with uh, no college education, no flight training, and only 10 weeks of training in their ground control stations to do the same job as a officer, college education, uh, two or more years of flight training under their belt um, in the Air Force. This has actually led to a lot of cultural conflict because it's actually a class system conflict. So if an enlisted guy with no college degree and no flight training can do the same job as a pilot can, then you can start to see where the disconnect might happen. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about why is it that you really don't need, and you don't need a pilot to fly a UAV. And in fact, there's been some evidence um, by an FAA study that shows pilots only screw it up because pilots who are used to flying a manned aircraft actually approach the problem in a different way than a gamer, which effectively is what we're, what we're turning people into. So I figured that would kind of catch on at Microsoft. Ah, we're all, we're all UAV pilots because we're gamers. Well, that's actually true. And we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens because, so w most of the larger size ones are controlled by these ground control stations, but they've actually started to realize that you don't really need a big unwieldy ground control station that you have to put on a trailer and truck around everywhere. You can actually do the same thing from a laptop. So uh, they typically reserve laptop control for smaller UAVs, but functionally there's no reason that you can't control a bigger plane from a laptop. This laptop can control this shadow. This laptop could control a Global Hawk um, aircraft, which is a really big, a, you know, a small jetliner size aircraft. That's that up top is today's future, uh, today's technology. What about the future? Well, the military envisions, even the Air Force envisions, that instead of having multiple people control just one, in fact, we need to invert that and have one, per one person control multiple unmanned vehicles, and not just multiple UAVs. This is a, you know, a shadow fixed wing. This is a fire scout 
autonomous helicopter. And in fact, if you haven't seen the big dog, it's worth going to watch those movies because this is the robot of the future that's going to be carrying everything around for you. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't really matter from a, a human perspective. When you're doing remote control of an unmanned vehicle technology, practically the only differences are speed, how fast does that thing move, and uh, latency in the communication signals. So for example, when I control a underwater unmanned vehicle, I don't get to talk to it as often as I need to talk to or would like to talk to a UAV. That's actually the same thing that's happened at JPL when they talk to the Mars rovers. They have, you can only, you go into range for just a short period of time, you get a burst of communications, you have to do rapid planning really quickly in 45 minutes um, with, uh, with Mars robots and then and you're out of the range again. And so it's a, it's a short rapid planning and then you have to trust that you're gonna go for some period of time without talking to them. Same thing for UUVs. So I get asked this question a lot, why? would you want one person to control multiple unman unmanned vehicles? Anybody, anybody think of why we would want to do this? Other than it's cool. Budget. Budget, close. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, one, depending on the tasks that, some, that the machines are doing and depending on their intelligence level, um, a human is, can make a lot of really smart decisions for a large group of robots. Mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine if there's 30 planes flying in a direction, well, maybe you only need to make a decision about whether they're going to evade like some mm -hmm. sort of group of enemies or something every once in a while. Mm -hmm. So you don't need like 30 people all trying to make this That's decision. Right. In fact, there's, there would be some literature that would suggest that that many people on team, there's an overhead in communication, so it's not good for the whole mission to have that many people. But even more practically, let's go back to money because that's really what it all comes down to. It's not really so much a money issue as it is. The military cannot recruit, the Air Force particularly, cannot recruit enough people to fly these. They just don't have enough people to do the job. And, you know, and we got Roombas, you know, whenever you go to MIT, I'm sure some of you have been there, you walk around and it looks like there's been a Roomba massacre. You know, there's just Roombas and Roomba parts laying everywhere. Anything that's even remotely robotic, there's a lot of that technology running around. And for these reasons that you just, we, if we're, and we are going to use more and more robots, the Army has said that in, by 2012, they're not going to make this goal, but they want to be one-third robots by 2012. So the Army wants to get rid of manned vehicles and make, you know, a third of them unmanned vehicles. That's amazing. If you actually look at the um, growth in the UAV industry, uh, you know, pilots, commercial pilots are starting to feel it, right? They're, in your lifetime, you will see the unmanned FedEx plane in the near term in your lifetime. For the young people in here, you will probably see the unmanned commercial airline pl plane. It, it might not actually be truly unmanned. We might leave a dummy pilot up there to make you feel better. Uh, because, oh, by the way, right now, Airbus planes can take off and land, actually can go gate to gate without a person ever touching the controls. So, um, you know, and then, and then we get asked this question all the time, well, why would a person ever want to have an unmanned commercial um, airplane or an unmanned cargo airplane? I got about a, several billion reasons why FedEx can't wait to get the pilot out, right? Because the number one cost for FedEx and UPS and the airlines, salary, training, medical, retirement. So as soon as they can get, that's it. I mean, I mean, they're, you know, we could probably send packages across the country for 10 cents as soon as we got the pilot out of the loop, right? So, so whether or not you agree that that should happen, money is a, is a serious motivator. And same thing for budget, right? So we, we need to do it. M the military needs to do it. They can't do it any other way for budget and manning reasons, but there are also these other teaming issues that, that come up. And in fact, um, go ahead. So um, you, you just brought it up that there's these Airbus, I think you said, that can go gate to gate. Mm -hmm. um, I assume that means that FedEx, if they wanted to, could implement a certain technology. So I assume there's legal reasons why um, FedEx doesn't do this. Why do you think that legal reason is? If we, have the we do have technology today, it is off the shelf today to do that. What do you think is holding FedEx back? Uh, well, the, the legal reason, but I, I... What do you think that legal reason is? Um, it's a government organization. Department of Homeland Security? Oh, yeah. They? Well, that, 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 they possibly could, but the FAA. The problem is, is that how to integrate unmanned vehicles into the national airspace. So their FAA is an incredibly conservative organization, and they do not want to let unmanned vehicles of that size into the airspace. In fact, it's actually an act of God that we get Global Hawks and some of the, uh, some of the military ones. It's a big issue that's being debated at levels far above all of us. 
Um, there's lots of hashing out going on in, in D.C. over this. But it will happen. Do you think they'll actually take uh, the decision to split airspace and have an automated airspace? No. I, I mean, it is one way. I don't think it'll happen. I just don't think that, that they have the ability. The logistics behind that would be fairly significant. They might do things like take altitude splits and do deconfliction. That, you know, so they'll segment out the airspace potentially, at least at first, that might happen. So, you know, unmanned vehicles are always flying in between 20 and 25,000 feet, for example. Something like that. That might happen at the beginning. Um, but it's... It's going to be, a, it's already starting to be a stampede. In fact, we're, this country is going to be eclipsed by other countries because other countries will get around these regulatory issues. They're already starting that. Australia, for example, will probably be the first to actually have the commercial uh, applications of cargo airplane and probably even the first uh, manned aircraft or passenger aircraft. So, um, you know, there'll be a lot of trial and error, but in the end, to make it work, because our, our airspace is already too congested as it is, they can't... That, that is not a long-term solution. We can't push, we're having trouble pushing the aircraft that we have now. And then once those um, constraints get relaxed, um, you're gonna see an, a huge spike in the increase. Because if, think about it, if I can remove the cost of the pilot from air cargo, then it becomes much cheaper to fly things, to, to move my things around the world instead of using uh, rail and highways and boat, we can actually, you know, air becomes a much better option than for, for some industries. So it's, and you know, in fact, there's a whole group of people who do nothing but look at logistics of these kinds of things, so. But it, but it, would, it would seem that a vertical split would be viable because as you fly against the ceiling, you can't fly manually anyway. Actually, it's not, it's not a human issue. It's a air density issue. So it's actually, it's not, it has nothing to do with a human. Vehicles, uh, air breathing engines, you know, uh, starting at above about 40,000 feet. Now, see, you're just like my students. You get me off in the segue, right? Um, they have problems. Actually, you just can't get enough. The density of the air is not, you don't have enough to cause the combustion to happen. You start to get some stalling and some Dutch rolls, and there's not enough density of air to, over the wings. And so that's why, you know, you, when you actually send uh, planes like the um, Concorde, they're actually rockets, more rocket than they are airplane, just, you know, for these reasons. Okay, let me get back on track. So, um, I was working with DARPA on this prog program called JUCAS. It was the Joint Unmanned Combat uh, Aerial System. It was the it was going to be the big bomber size UAV, um, and so we worked on that with DARPA for a while. Then they trans transitioned it over to the Air Force. The Air Force. Anything that smacks of UAV, the Air Force cancels. So who didn't see this coming, right? So DARPA transitioned the JUCAS program over to the Air Force. The Air Force canceled it. Um, and all I got out of being on that grant was this slide. But it's a good slide. <laughs> What's that? It is what, the, it is what DARPA slash the military envisions the future warfare battle space. So it's going to be, these are un, um, unmanned vehicles, manned vehicles in the, on the air, in the ground satellite communication support. They're going to connect everything on something that they call the global information grid. So all people in the grid, whether you're a pilot or you're a warfighter on the ground or you're on a ship, wherever you are in the space, theoretically you're going to have access to all the other information that everybody else sees. It's like the, the mama of the social networking going on here, right? Now, I mean, you know, this is, that's DARPA crazy talk, right? You know, it's, it makes it great for, for a great picture. But let me show you, and, and, and the military is definitely moving that way, and let me show you what it looks like from the operator's perspective inside the military. This is a Predator ground control station. It's actually a little bit of an old picture because if you could see one today, there's even more displays that have been bolted on on the sides of these poor guys' um, ground control stations. And this is a single operators, there, there are these places called operation centers and they're the command centers. So the guys here are talking to these guys and these guys in the air operation center try to coordinate the battlefield to, you know, I need somebody here doing this, somebody doing this. And so this, this guy has even more responsibility, which is why he has a few more screens. Um, and so, <laughs> I don't know if you can see, and, it, and it's this case for both. Um, you know, this guy has six screens, four keyboards, four mice, 
a couple of telephones. And oh, by the way, that's what the Predator Ground Control Station looks like. I, I um, sat with them all summer. And uh, in a Three Stooges kind of a hilarious way, um, it would be really funny if it weren't for the fact that people could be dying over this, is that, you know, they'll be typing on a keyboard. They'll reach up to type on one of their keyboards and to send a really important message, like drop that bomb. And they'll be like, crap, wrong keyboard. And they slide out, oh, crap, wrong keyboard, you know. Oh, I can't, where's that damn mouse, you know, that works for this screen or whatever. And so um, it's a great illustration of how technology is really running over the human. Uh, I bet you if I were to walk around some of the spaces at Microsoft, I would see lots of displays everywhere. And, and by the way, we like it. If you were to ask these guys, they, oh, we love it. We love all this information. We love having everything at our fingertips, except we have to ask ourselves, do we really know how to control it? I hope that you don't have, I hope that Microsoft of all places has at least got it down to one keyboard. And if you do do that, you need to talk to the Air Force because they really need your help. Um, but uh, how did this happen? How is it that we we grew from, in fact, the original Predator workstation was this screen, this screen, this screen, this screen. And oh, by the way, now I, I, you got to appreciate this is, you can see where his head is. He actually, th these are engineering screens. So this pilot doesn't even look at these screens, which are actually right there as eye level. Those aren't for him. These are, these were the original screens. And then General Atomics is a company in San Diego, um, populated by a bunch of Navy fighter pilots, I'm sorry to report. Um, basically a bunch of garage engineers and so every time they added a new functionality to the predator oh we want this new piece of information we want this map where I can talk to these other people I want a new instant messaging device um, and instead of actually doing a systems engineering approach to maybe integrating everything they would just literally bolt on a new display and in fact that's how that's how this has happened and this is actually worse in real life than it actually looks like because they just keep bolting on a new display a new computer and so Actually, you, when these guys have to like climb into these computers, are climbing in all over these hard drives, and there's wires going everywhere. Um, and it's a really sad statement, I think, uh, but a typical statement for the defense industry that the operator comes last. We develop the technology, we spend all the money on the hardware, maybe the software. We're starting to realize that software is really Im important, really mostly the functionality, not necessarily the user interface. And if there's any money left over, then we'll actually concentrate on the human aspect of it. They're starting to come around and change uh, because they're starting to realize that uh, the best designed hardware technology, if the operators can't understand how to use them, they're not getting used. And in fact, that's about 75% of all functionality that people like you design into these systems are not actually being used by operators in the field. They can't find it. They don't know where it is. They're not getting the right training. The functionality is not obvious. It's not intuitive. Um, so I could go on and on and on, and I'm sure, you know, people in this room are just as horrified as I am over this. Uh, but clearly, we can do better. So, let me tell you about my general philosophy for how we try to approach designing systems. So, in the old days, the old days being in the last 20 years, the idea when you, when you start to design a system with a lot of automation in it, there's this concept called role allocation. Who does what? Should the automation fly the plane? Should I navigate the plane? Uh, you know, we could apply this to, you know, process control. Who should be, you know, changing the rods going in, rods going out? The good news is automation is doing that, thank God. Uh, really reliable automation. Um, so this, what this, is, this picture is showing you, that if the human is really good at something and the automation is not, the machine, that's what it was actually called when they did this originally, that it really should be only something that the human does. Here's where the human is better than the automation. Here's where the automation is better than the human, notionally. And then there's this space in the middle, this white space. And that's the space where, in the old days, humans or automation could do something. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a good idea about where, I've never seen a real, like a, toy, a coin toss about who, who should be doing this, a human or not automation. Well, Google's doing this now with the car. Uh, should let the human do it or the, you know, that's, that, well, that's a whole other sidebar conversation we could have about the Google car. Uh, but the question is, you know, how do, first of all, how do we know? And then in terms of my area of future, I, it's not an or issue here for me. And, and, and in fact, that's really where most of the defense industry has been and certainly a lot of the commercial industry in terms of uh, process control. It's not really an and to them. It's either the human or the automation will do, will do this. And maybe we let the human come into the loop for these very limited functionalities. But I'm trying to proselytize to 
everyone, including Microsoft, that we really need to look at the joint space between humans and automation. Now, I probably don't have to preach as much here as I needed to do for, like I was at Boeing this morning. It's still, you know, I'm still having to, to uh, make people understand that systems are growing sufficiently complex, particularly the military systems and even aviation systems, that we actually need to figure out how humans and automation can complement each other's strengths. And one of the things that we worry about when we start to talk about these complex systems are we're, we want to target people's moderate levels of workload. So we know that if you work too much, you're not going to do very well. And this is called the yerkes dotson law. It's a notional representation, not really a law. Uh, but under low levels of workload, you can also perform badly. Um, today we're going to talk about, I'm going to keep you here, we're worried really about how to keep people's workload um, that would be high down to a moderate level, almost like you see the Predator ground control station, you, they've got all these screens and, and when things are busy and when they're doing an airstrike, they, they are overwhelmed with the amount of information. But it actually turns out for 11 half out of 12 hour missions that the Predator operators actually don't do anything. There's a lot of sleeping, there's a lot of Sudoku playing, and so actually there's, there's a huge component of boredom as there is in the nuclear reactor world. And so I'm not really going to talk about it today, I can give you some information on that later if you'd like, but we actually have a big thrust in um, what to do about automation that's so boring. Anybody remember last summer what happened? That where automation was so boring? Pilots the pilots overflew Minneapolis. How did that happen? They were so bored in the cockpit, and by the way, why am I not a commercial airline pilot? It's really boring. It is, most of the time, it's a very, very boring job. So, uh, you know, I think we as, we, as designers, need to start thinking about, are there better ways that we can keep our people engaged during times of low workload? Okay, so let's talk about um, that high workload level in the presence of micro-air vehicles. So the Army has a few of these fielded right now, although they're getting ready to release the BAA to actually do this and. I'm throwing that out there because I just got this insider piece of information and some people in this room might want to know that. So the Army wants to actually, they've recognized that this is not a good system, right? So I wouldn't even really call this a micro air vehicle. I would just call this a small unmanned aerial vehicle. It's a flying trash can, kind of does this hover thing. Um, and this is the kind of an Xbox-like controller that they're using here. And so um, their job is to, they're in the field, and they can't call a predator or a global hawk, you know, who these things are circling overhead all the time, but to actually call into the network to get a picture of something near you, you like you say, I need to see over that hill because I think there's some bad guys just about a half a mile in front of me. Can you tell me are there any bad guys there or not? It takes too long to connect through. It's like the old um, operator networks of the, of the, you know, the 40s where you see them plug in. I mean, it just takes forever to get through that network. So what the Army guys want, and Marines, uh, they would like to have their own personal unmanned vehicles that they can fly themselves to go do that local imagery that they need instead of having to rely on this gargantuan network of information like you saw in the big picture. Uh, great idea. So this is their first cut at it, um, having a, a, a gas power. This thing is so loud, by the way, that if you were an insurgent and this thing came anywhere near you, you would for sure know to run away. Um, and that could be, you know, that is actually one non-lethal form of warfare, just herd everybody away from you. Mm. But what, you, what you're seeing here in this poor guy's backpack, the whole system that he has to wear, the computer and the communication device, that's an extra 35 to 40 pounds that he has to wear on his back. Don't, don't forget that this poor guy is actually under hostile fire. So at any point in time, he could be shot. So he has a bunch of other of his buddies that are around him trying to protect this poor guy because he's heads down the whole time. He's got this controller, and you know he's got control, and he's looking up, and, and, and it was far away. They actually go to a, a screen where they're trying to figure out from the screen what's happening with some very poorly designed. I mean, I have to tell you, it's great to be in this field because it can only get better. I mean, everything that's coming out is so badly designed. Um, so it requires his full attention. So he's way over on the right side of that curve. That's why he has to have a, his buddies flock around him to make sure he's okay. Because it's something we call situation awareness, which I'm sure most of you have heard. You cannot have any situation awareness if you're having to concentrate on the controls and try to hand fly this thing just like an RC pilot would be, right? So, and, and that's actually the model of most UAV manufacturers and uh, display designers are. This is just a big fancy remote control aircraft, right? So we need to fly it like one. That's a big problem because we're forcing people to be saturated with their workload. And in this particular environment, it's very bad because it's a very dangerous environment. 
So this is actually what it looks like. Um, you know, he's got his buddy nearby. His buddy is there to make sure, both to help him spot the vehicle, but also to keep the guy um, who's doing the flying safe. This, I think this picture is only about three years old. The system itself is probably about seven to ten years. It depends on what, where you want to talk about, about when it was built and then, you know. Pretty outdated for what's right now. Oh, this is cutting edge. Oh, yeah. I, you know, okay, so of course you see that, right? I mean, and it's funny because, you know, I used to be in the defense industry, or, you know, the, the defense machine, and now I'm outside of it. And it's an amazing gap between what is available on commercial off the shelf and what has to go through the military standardization because actually they have all the um, they want to ruggedize everything and you have to meet certain mil specs and so what it takes to do that can actually it adds a lot of years and time and cost and and everything um, but yes they are actually still using incredibly outdated technology so these are uh, our friends up the road at MIT iRobot you know right so they um, you know have these nice video uh, these little robots Again, though, that guy is using a Xbox-like controller. And um, the funny thing is when they got Xbox controllers as opposed to DOS line commands, I mean, they thought that was uh, all that, right? Xbox controllers are good for video games. They're fun for you as a gamer because you're trying to have, I mean, there's a fun component for you and a control component. They are not fun for military people whose lives are at stake who are being shot at in these environments, right? And so um, it's actually very difficult. iRobot has not heard this message yet. They are not drinking from the Missy Cummings Kool-Aid yet. I keep trying and they keep resisting me. I will win uh, because the Army is going to force them to. Because, again, anything that requires full attention to do, full saturation, you, this is not a good situation for these guys who are in the field. If you're in an air-conditioned trailer in Creech Air Force Base in Nevada where you're flying something from 7,000 miles away, uh, that might be a little bit different story, but even they don't need it. When you've got people in, in the field, under dangerous environments, you need to try to keep um, their situation as high as possible. And it's arguable whether or not this is a really, a, I mean, you know, he has to stand that close to go look in the window. You know, I mean, this is not really helping this guy that much. <laughs> One question we get asked a lot is, well, why do you even, you know, if you're doing all this imagery, um, why don't you just use satellite imagery? Why, if you want to do local exploration, why don't you just use satellite imagery? And the military's got some really good satellites that um, can give a lot of good information. The problem is, is that a 2D overhead view is not necessarily a good indication of what you could see in the real world. And even in, I would say, fairly benign environments, in urban environments in places like Fallujah, Afghanistan, uh, the landscape can change dramatically just overnight, right? Because what will happen is insurgents will blow up cars or they'll create obstacles. So even in an urban landscape where you're expecting soldiers to go on patrol can dramatically change day to day, hour to hour if there's a lot of activity. So this is why you actually need a system that is a lot more flexible than having to use this 100-pound gas-powered um, UAV and the 35-pound pack on your back. You need something that um, operators can use a lot e more, e more easy plus quickly. Okay, so come into play um, our little quad rotor. Now, I'd like to tell you that we're somebody special for having this quad rotor, but you yourself can have this quad rotor if you just go, go on the internet and call up Ascending Technologies and send them $4,500. They will send you the same quad rotor. And in fact, at MIT, you're really nobody unless you have the Roomba that's in a million pieces in your lab, plus a bunch of these quad rotors that are also in a million pieces in your lab. Oh, yeah, and we got a parrot, too. Of course we have a parrot, because every, every good UAV researcher is going to have the latest toy off, then we fight each other with our little um, iPhone parrots. So uh, nothing special about the Ascending Technologies Hummingbird. That's actually a compliment. Because it is, it is a testament to engineering and the, and the guys, they're MIT grads from, from Ascending Technologies. Um, they have actually basically put flight capability into everyone's hand. Everyone in this room, right, can control this vehicle, um, particularly after we give you our iPhone application uh, to do it. But, uh, you know, their, their, their controller algorithms are really stable. 
So you can buy this thing off the shelf and, and start as an RC pilot. And that's actually how they, they originally started to market it. We came along later and added the iPhone control to it later. But it's got, you can buy, it comes with an RC controller when you buy it. You can fly it around and, oh, that's kind of cool and fun. And I think they're selling some to some first responder agencies like police departments who might want to use these things for some overhead surveillance. Um, but our big leap was, you know, that's great to have that. And that's exactly the kind of vehicle, so you, you were asking, that's the kind of vehicle these guys need, right? These things, you can actually, they weigh a pound and a half, maybe, right? That's easy to carry around in your backpack, and it's really not that hard to put together. Uh, and you need to get, so you need to get rid of the 100-pound vehicle and put that, which will go in your own. You can each, you, everyone could have their own little um, UAV this way, right? And then you need to get rid of that 35-pound ground control station and use an iPhone. And that's where we, okay, so I have to tell you how this happened. I, I knew I wanted to do this project. I wanted to do a small device control, one-handed, um, uh, using a small micro air vehicle. I was going to use a little Sony Vio, the really small UX something or other, um, because it's a fully capable laptop. And uh, probably because my significant other loves Apple, which makes me hate Apple, as mo those of you who are married can probably appreciate that relationship. Um, he loves everything Apple. It drives me crazy, right? So I had this uh, um, anti-Apple bias. and. Uh, so I told my students we were going to do it on this little laptop. And it's, it's actually not much bigger than an iPhone. And then they begged me, please, 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 we want to do it on an iPhone. No, 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 it's just not, you know, it, it's not a good, um, it's too risky. You know, that SDK for Apple is a pain in the ass to work with. They begged, begged, begged. And so we made a deal. I said, if you can get it done in a month, if you can have this thing up and flying in a month, um, then you could, I'll buy you all iPhones and we'll go on the iPhone. You know, like three weeks and four days later, that, that thing was up and flying. We had all kinds of YouTube videos. It went, it went viral. We were on Wired. I was like, all right, you can have it. You can have the iPhones. And so it just gets a good motivator for the older people in the audience. You know, if they want it, give it to them because then, then we produce something really great. But I will tell you, we are not iPhone um, specific. We are device agnostic. We're using the iPhone here, but this would work on an Android or any other device that you can, you know, it, there's nothing special about the iPhone because as I'll show you in a second, we've got it on a server that basically um, feeds the system. So we developed two modes to go with this technology. One is something called waypoint navigation and the other one we call nudge control, which as I need to remind, we actually filed a patent on nudge control. And I have to remind that we just caught another company claiming that they've got nudge control. Oh! I hate the lawyers. All right, so, uh, so now what we've done is we recognize that, first of all, people who are using this, they're trying to get a picture or a video of something, right? So in fact, the platform itself doesn't really matter, and they don't really care. They're not going to be pilots, these people, right? They shouldn't have to have any training, not even as an RC pilot, to do this. All they really care is, you know, I'm here, and I want to see what's going on one block down and over. That's what I want to see. So I should just be able to lay, you've got the map right here, I should just be able to lay a waypoint down anywhere on this map, and that's actually what happens. You click on it, just like in Google Maps, you lay a waypoint down, and in fact, what you can do is you can actually stick the iPhone in your pocket, and uh, the, I, the map would actually, if it took a while to get there, it would fly itself, it's got good um, stabilization, some obstacle avoidance that can go with it, and then it vibrates when it gets there, to let you know I'm here at the place that you told me to come. Now that's good for gross control, right? So I'm here, I want it to go over there um, and let me know when you get there because I might actually have other things to do like shoot the bad guy or keep myself safe. Then once you get to the general place that you want to be, it goes into the nudge control mode and that's where the camera comes on and then you start to do local control based on visually what you're seeing. And I'll show you a movie. Um, but that's actually kind of what you're seeing here is that and you can have the window in the window right this is what the camera is seeing at any given time but this is where you are in the, in the world so that's what it looks like 4500 um, 50 buck webcam and uh, we use Wi-Fi you don't have to use Wi-Fi we just do for just to make it easy for us at MIT and so that you know we've talked to Boeing today Boeing is uh, this was funded by ONR and Boeing um, so they can fly the iPhone from their desks in um, Seattle. They want to be able to fly them back at MIT, and you can do that. Okay, so this is what when you, the flight control mode looks like. So uh, what we've done is we've basically just taken all the years that I spent flying as a pilot, learning to take off and land. Um, we've abstracted it into two buttons, take off, land. So that's pretty much what happens. 
Take off. It takes off. You, I mean, remember, you're not anywhere necessarily even near the vehicle. You can take it off from anywhere. It takes off. It lands by itself. And then fly. That's the little fly button. What that means is um, it will, you don't need to, when it's in waypoint mode, you just hit the waypoints and it flies by itself. The fly button is for the nudge control because that's actually for the local control. So when you hit that fly button, the camera's going to turn on and we're going to give you direct control over the vehicle. We're not really going to give you direct control because you're not a good pilot, and we're going to explain to you how that happens. But it also serves as a dead man switch because I don't know how many of you, how many of you have iPhones in here? For God's sakes, that thing is slippery. I drop that thing all the time, right? And if, can you imagine if you're flying it, and we are using the accelerometers in the iPhone, so if you drop it, you don't want the, you know, the, the vehicle. So if, you, if your hand comes off the fly button, but you can actually hold it with one hand and fly it with one hand. And, and we can all agree that this is actually a much better uh, input device than an Xbox for this purpose. All right, so this is, what hap this is what it looks like when you go into nudge control mode. So we basically do a transparent layer of, this is your joystick, effectively, over the world that you're seeing. And I'll explain the world in the background in a second. So as you tip it forward, zoom, zoom, the little red dot goes forward and back and left and right. And this is it's effectively a compass rose. We don't put any numbers on it for right now because in, in this initial testing that you saw, we were doing it inside a motion capture room. Um, John Howe, for those of you who might know him, he has a motion capture room at MIT. Nothing special about a motion capture room except that they're big pains in the asses to work with. I mean, I don't know how many of you worked in here, but, you know, that's a whole, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second about, you know, the, the difficulty behind that. But um, so you, you know, go left, go right. Uh, and then if you want to go, because the, the vehicle itself will go like this, but in fact it rotates, right, because it's a quad rotor. So you have this, so if you swipe your finger across the top of the arc, it'll kind of rotate and turn. The good news is, is that it's very intuitive to people. I mean, you, you just have to show them one time and people understand immediately, just as when you first learned to use your iPhone. You, somebody just had to show you something once and then you, you understood it then. And you actually can change the altitude. You uh, up, down, up down, right? So it's a, it's a very easy way. And you, you get some feedback inside. You can actually see the glowing ring. So you actually know that you're increasing. And there's a little, you can't really see it in this image, but there's a little altimeter over here that will actually give you some objective, um, absolute altitude information. So this is the secret sauce, if you will, for what's going on. And this is effectively what we filed the patent for, was what we're doing, how we make this happen is, in the world today, when, as a fighter pilot, when I was controlling my F-18, I was given something called rate control, uh, which in, it's expressed in something, uh, what we call second order control, where you actually have both control of rate and acceleration in an aircraft. You do that, so when, I, when I'm in the F-18 and I push the stick left, I'm actually commanding the computer to roll at a particular rate that matches the rate of which I'm moving the stick, right, in a direction, I'm actually, you know, if I push a little forward and left, the elevators and the actuator, you know, everything will move a little bit to exactly give me that command because I'm telling it exactly how I want it to move and how fast I want it to move. That's really important in a fighter jet because I need to be able to whip that thing around really fast if I need to get a missile off the rails and shoot at a bad guy behind me, right? So that's why fighter pilots need to be able to pull a lot of Gs and be able to do these high-speed missions and the aircraft themselves have to be able to withstand, withstand that because you need all that maneuverability. Well, you don't need that maneuverability in a commercial airline. I can tell you that right now. And you, you definitely don't need that, that kind of maneuverability in an image-based UAV where we're just trying to get the picture. And in fact, arguably, you mean the more roll and, and dynamic motion that you would have on the vehicle, the more difficult it is for the camera to stay stabilized. So we want that in a fighter jet, second order and higher control, but we don't want that in a UAV for especially for those who you're trying to get a good picture on. Arguably, uh, there's also a big problem with rate control in UAVs, and um, that is something of latency. So we know from flight control, uh, and you know, I can give you some papers on this if you really want some long and boring equations, but if you uh, have delays in your system, that can actually cause some oscillations in the control system, particularly caused by the pilot, right? So in fact, what happens is if I push the stick left and I don't get any feedback from the system, and all of you probably know this from your work on user interfaces, what does the user do if they don't get the feedback that they want? 
they do it again or they do it more or they do it harder and then what happens is if you have the latency in the system these controls commands actually get sent to the system and they and the systems themselves are already on a very thin margin of uh, controlled behavior immediately you'll put it into an oscillatory actual oscillatory motion and the vehicle will crash and the human brain itself you know at best you have about a two millisecond delay in your brain um, that's gonna you, you can't even see information and respond faster than that so the latencies by the way it takes about you can get about a second and a half delay um, sometimes higher if you're trying to fly a UAV from here into Afghanistan and so a second and a half delay plus the delay of just your neuromuscular delay whoever thought it was a good idea to let somebody land one of these by themselves in the first place I mean I'm just aghast that pilots were actually ever allowed to land a UAV uh, from that far away because I, I could have just told them they didn't even have to spend all the money they should have said crash or not crash crash we've seen it all the time you're gonna crash these and in fact the Air Force finally realized that they were crashing so many that they've actually um, they're gonna go back and retrofit everything with an auto land function the Missy Cummings land button because they finally realized they're gonna continue to lose more vehicles because it's not I don't care you, even Chuck Yeager can't do it right and it's not Chuck Yeager's fault there's the latency in the, in the bandwidth and there's the latency in the brain even Chuck Yeager has latency in his brain You can, and sometimes they do do that. Sometimes, but it's not as fun. See, this is the air. That's that's actually how the army does it. In fact, well, they actually the army has a backup RC pilot there all the time in case they need it. But they actually, it's the tractor beam. I mean, you know, come on, we've all seen Star Wars. I mean, you can get the tractor beam that actually just guides it all the way into a perfect landing. I flew on carriers. Planes always land on a carrier by by themselves, automated than a human ever does. So we've had the technology for a while. So it seems like. Uh, Air, Air Force seems to be insistent on human control. That, Why do you think? It, is, it, does that go back to your kind of budget status, prestige, all the other issues? Well, they're the Air Force. I mean, and in fact, it's you know on a different socio-technical um, discussion, it's a real hard thing for the Air Force because if we don't need any more pilots, and they're starting to need a lot fewer real pilots, what does it mean for us as a service? right it's the Air Force of video gamers I mean that's really and that is what it's turning into and they don't like it right it's not nearly as fun and as cool and we call it the white scarf mentality and of course it's easy for me to say I got mine <laughs> I got to I got to fly and land planes on carriers <laughs> Air Force guys they don't land on carriers that's why Navy pilots are always better than Air Force pilots anyone can land on a three-mile runway um, <laughs> so so what's happening here is we've got what we do is we do this position commanding of the vehicle. So even a nudge control, it works a lot like the waypoint control, meaning that when a person starts to, to do all these manipulations with the, the iPhone, we actually translate those commands into sets of position commands. So even though if you go 45 degrees or even you go 60 degrees over, that's actually going to be translated to move forward one foot or move forward, you know, in some, in some sets of feet. And these are, these are um, dimensions that can be changed by someone else but not by you because basically we've got constraint layers built into the system. So even if you, you know, were, were, even you as a person who, you know, there are some people who actually have a lot big control magnitude inputs, right? or even little fine control, and by the way, there is a gender effect by this way, you know, women are, are, are typically not nearly as big on the controls. It doesn't matter though, right? Because the system is interpreting everyone's commands, and if you insistently keep doing this, it will say, oh, I wanna go forward a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. But what you won't see is you won't see the, video, the vehicle in real life. You know, when somebody goes like this, they think in their head, the vehicle goes like this and then treks forward. What the vehicle does, it goes, hmm, hmm, hmm. It just kind of hops forward, you know, really slowly, and it makes and it makes progress in that direction. So we're actually fooling our user. Now, I don't want to, you know, uh, get into a um, an ethical debate about whether it's not whether it's fair or not to be fooling your user. But I think we would all agree that um, in this case, uh, because what we've done here is we've made it crash proof, right? No matter who that person is or what they're doing. They're not going to put the system, they're never going to get it to this oscillation loop boundary where they might push it over the edge. The system is going to be very safe. The other issue with this is the users like it, right? Now, I, I probably don't need to explain this to you, although I have to spend a lot of time explaining this to defense people and even military people. Um, if people don't like a technology, they're not going to use it. You appreciate that. 
but this is again why the military, you know, their 75% of functionality that they have paid for to be put in these systems is not being used. It's not being used because it's too difficult to work with, people don't like it, and if people like a technology and feel good about a technology, they will use a technology. I mean, the Roomba, is, if that's not living proof that people will work with a crappy piece of technology, I don't even know what is. And let me tell you, even the guys at the household division will tell you, at iRobot, they would admit to you in person, they have told me that they think the Roomba is crap. Um, but it's an amazing thing, people love it, right? So if you can, if you can have people t uh, chip into this, um, uh, the, this device, uh, then you will, they will use it. Are you changing the, the position of the operator in terms of this? It's not a case of flying a plane anymore. It's that's right. It's a case of flying the view through the land. That's perfect. That's exactly the metaphor. That's right. You've got somebody. Nothing to do with the position of the craft. I, I, it, it is the position, but the you're controlling, you're, con you're flying the camera, right, yeah. right. and that's, what, that's the big thing that we try to tell people is you're no longer, you're flying the camera, you're not flying the vehicle. The vehicle is being flown by Ascending Technologies, who's doing a fabulous job at it, right? And you don't want the human in loop there in any way, shape, or form because it's too complicated, particularly a quad rotor technology. I mean, there's a lot of complex aerodynamics that are going on in the control of that vehicle. You don't want the human, and the human is not going to be there to save the day either. If something goes wrong and one of the rotors starts, you know, you just either want to land it or hopefully we make them cheap enough that if they crash, then we just don't really even care that they crashed, right? Because they're fairly um, easy to use technologies. So, uh, I mean, easy to replace technologies. So, we are giving users feedback that's not exactly a mapping to the world. And that sometimes I think that's, that's a little against what you might hear at work, right? We want them to do natural mapping, one-to-one -one mapping. We want users to have the right mental model. But in fact, you know, in this case, we want the users to have the mental model that makes them work with the technology. And it goes back to that, that space that I was showing you in the function allocation. We want them to work with the technology. And so to work with the technology, we're presenting information that's not exactly how it's mapping in the world. But because they're actually not seeing the vehicle when it's doing this mission, they, and even if, and if you were to come to MIT, and I would invite all of you to come and fly it, we're actually in flight test right now, you actually will, it still looks to you, you don't really, you know, you're not a seasoned pilot. You don't really appreciate that it's not doing this big yanking and banking, even though you're doing this with the iPhone. You see it moving. It's adjusting to your commands, so it makes you feel good that it's doing what you're telling to, but you don't need to be Chuck Yeager and feel good that it, it is actually doing a 90-degree knife edge through the buildings. Okay, so let's look at, here's the ar architecture. So we've got the displays that come up on the iPhone or any handheld device. You know, it, just, we're agnostic here. Um, I don't want to seem like I'm, I'm not an Apple rep. Uh, we send it to a server, what we call the MAV server, which then goes into the um, API for the whatever specific system, which then actually controls the vehicle itself. You can take this off and you can put a Predator UAV. You can take this off and you could put an Airbus plane up here. It doesn't, you know, they, so this just came up at Boeing. Boeing says, well, you know, could we fly a Global Hawk with your? Oh, sure we could. There's nothing, there's no reason that you couldn't, right? You're see, it's that same information. In fact, that's how Global Hawks are controlled right now. Basically, they're highly automated. Operators give the position updates. It's the same kind of idea, and the vehicle flies itself. The only, I mean, there are other reasons why you might not want to do that from an iPhone. Let's say you had a lot of complex systems information coming back, and you might want that being fed to somebody else. But practically, there's no reason. In fact, this doesn't even have to be a UAV. This could be an I, this could be a, um, a ground robot. It could be uh, you know some kind of water-based robot. So it doesn't really matter what's out here on this. And in fact, in fact, a two-dimensional robot on the ground would be a lot easier because we could get rid of the altitude. Um, Representation, but even that, it's, that's it's it's not causing does any problems. Use, uh, satellite radio for control, or how does it? They do satellite communications. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As our that's how they're doing all long distance. What's the bandwidth of that I'm I'm sure I don't know. I doubt that information is pu publicly available. Um, uh, it is a problem though that um, they do have problems with gaps in communication. In fact, that's actually the big issue with the FAA is that what if you lose link with your system? And that does happen. 
And so they've actually won, actually a Global Hawk did go lost link and the designers had put in some great contingency planning and it landed itself exactly like it was supposed to. Now that kind of um, model is, what's that? Was, that was an automated landing? Yes, uh, they all, they're all automated. Humans are not allowed to land the Global Hawk and they never have been. The Global Hawks are substantially more expensive than Predator UAVs. And, which is kind of funny because it's also an Air Force program, but it's a different Air Force program. Anybody know the origins of the Global Hawk? What government agency did the Global Hawk come out of? It's a DARPA slash CIA kind of, you know, so it actually went a different route um, uh, than the, the other UAVs have gone. And so right away, it has always been highly automated, which is interesting because the Air Force also has this other UAV, which is not highly automated at all. And, you know, it's, it, when you actually talk to them, it's as if the two sides of the, UAV world inside the Air Force, they don't talk to each other either. So the, sorry, so the, the, the satellite link, do they, are they disrupted by solar flares? And they can be, among other things, right? And this is actually um, a big concern in the future. I think a very valid concern um, certainly is what about some kind of uh, electronic defense, you know, what are we going to have to do to put a security systems in place? The picture, the DARPA picture just begs for that. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, well, and, and we've certainly seen uh, that, you know, what, what is it, the, it, was it in Iraq, Afghanistan, when they were downloading the pictures that were already coming off the Predator because they were over the air broadcast? They were not encrypted at all. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, is that, is that people were uh, aghast at that. All of us in the business, we've known that for a long time. Um, I think the only real sin there was what General Atomics did is that they, they, from the vehicle, they would, when they beam down the video, they always beam down the Latin long on the video. So that is actually what the problem was. It's not that they were sending video over the air. Your average human, you could intercept all the predator imagery you want. Let's say we could get it right now. We would have no clue what we're looking at. The human brain does terrible. We just can't. I'm looking at a hill. I'm looking at a city street somewhere. I have no idea where that is, right? It was the only, the only problem was that they were attaching the digits to it, which is how they actually knew where they were. Satellite, you have this constant delay. So it, it, in, in any form of feedback loop. Right, that's what I'm saying. So at, at, you could never do it. At best, at best, I think that's a 1.2 second delay. But it can be up to two plus seconds for other reasons that you get the delay. And that's, it is that, I mean, this is a physics problem, right? You cannot fix this problem, you are always going to have the delay um, when you're using these satellite communications, which is why humans should have never been allowed to ever land them. Just a little bit further down that road. What about the satellite IO as a bottleneck? You take that darker picture. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, 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 you're 100% right. Um, we're addressing these issues, you know, I mean, I, both, I, I mean, I know just because of my um, work with the military, but, um, you know, they're trying, you know, the more satellites, the, the safety of the satellites, right. There, there are people who are a lot smarter than me that are, that's all they do is think about that. You know, I mean, if, you know, Lincoln Lab, you know, the, the, right, right up the road from MIT and Draper, you know, super black programs. There's a lot of people working on those issues. So, uh, but back to the, the poor old guy on the ground that we're just trying to take 35 pounds off his back and let him have that picture of the top of the building around the corner that he needs to see. So, uh, one of, like a good human in the loop person, we ran a study, a good usability study, um, uh, with statistics and everything to show that these were, that, that our, idea, our idea was a good one. I argue a lot with computer science people over whether or not, you know, is a demo good enough or do you actually have to do a real experiment? Um, it does matter depending on where you sit. If you're in a company and you're trying to make a profit, probably a demo is good enough. If you're, if you're happy with it, if you're in a university lab and you're trying to get tenure, you better run real experiments. Okay, so we looked at, uh, we used 14 experiments in a motion capture room, John House motion capture room, and we gave the users a map this basically the map that you're seeing here, but they were in a completely different space. They never saw the map, the vehicle. They never saw the room. All they were given is they're in another room with four walls. I mean, they have no idea what they're looking at. They look at a sheet of paper and they're given the iPhone and they were given three minutes of training and that's it. All they were shown is, you know, here's the fly button, here's the land button, here's how you tilt it. They were given one little test flight of less than a minute and then they were off doing the experiment. They were all, there was like a $200 Best Buy, oh, um, reward for whoever did the best. So we always try to bribe our people as much as possible. 
Uh, and what they had to do is they had to take off. And they were given, so they were given this map, but they weren't given these labels. They knew this was the takeoff spot. They knew there was an eye chart over here that they had to go read the eye chart. And then once they read the eye chart, they had to go, uh, I'm sorry, where's the, uh, oh, the person of interest right here. They had to go look at a person of interest. And then after the experiment, they were asked to pick out of a lineup who that person of interest was. That's an important, actually, experimental step because we're using recognition versus recall, right? We can talk later if you want to know more about why that's so important. So, and then they had to land it. So I've got a video here. Let me walk you through it. Let me just stop it right there. Okay. So the person is doing, the intent was, is that they took off, they had the takeoff button, then they were supposed to navigate to the eye chart being a GPS coordinate, plop, they put the coordinate down, and then once they got to the eye chart via the GPS, then they switched into nudge control, which is why you're seeing the map here. So the person just laid down the coordinate, and then this is what, what the webcam on the vehicle sees. You don't see it here because they haven't switched to nudge control yet. And you can actually see the vehicle here takes off, and then the eye chart is here on this wall. So what you're going to see, I'm going I'm to get it off pause, and the vehicle's going to go over here, and the person, you're going to see the person switch to nudge control and kind of look around, and the person realizes that at the altitude that they're at, they can't really see anything, so they're going to need to increase the altitude, and you'll see the, the gesture and the vehicle come up. So it goes over there, and so you, can, you saw the little picture of the window and the window come up. Oh, yeah, I need to, I need to raise my altitude a little bit. And they're, and they're seeing, um, with that transparent effect, they see the room behind and they start looking around. All right. Uh, oh, that's not interesting. oh, there they are. There they see the eye chart. So, $50 webcam, no special stabilization on this platform at all. And that's the image that you're getting out of the webcam. We were amazed that it's, it was that good. Uh, we could, and there have been lots of people have suggested, oh, you need to gimbal the camera and de basically decouple the vehicle dynamics from the camera dynamics. Sure, we could, but um, I am an engineer, and every engineer knows as soon as the word gimbal shows up anywhere, it means lots of extra dollars. And for an aircraft, even more importantly, what does it mean? Lots of extra weight, right? So, yeah, we could, and if I was, if I was a good government contractor and I was trying to you know, generate lots of billable hours and ways to jack up the price of something, I could do that. But in the sake of let's keep this as low cost as possible and commercially off the shelf viable, let's not do that. Let's keep it cheap. And you know, having a static mounted camera to the airframe is actually it's a good way to go. I mean, and, and because in fact, when you actually manipulate the vehicle in terms of the control system, you don't have to have an extra layer of control either, right? Because then if you have to try to figure out the camera and the vehicle are moving two different ways, then you have to have another control layer in there. And uh, that was beyond, you know, I was racing against Parrot to get the next YouTube video out. So I knew you know, we didn't have that kind of time. Okay. All right. So um, you see what they're seeing. And in fact, uh, you know, sometimes it would be blurry and it wasn't always easy. But for the most part, it, um, we'd had really great success with that. And because of some problems with the streaming and, and the Wi-Fi network and everything, we could only get about probably 8 to 10 frames per second at best. So... Uh, which we were a little worried about because the cognitive literature will tell you you need it at 15 frames per second for basically so the human eye sees it as a continual uh, stream of videos. So it was a little choppy, but not one person complained. Um, and they were able to do, they did a very, very good job. I'll show you the numbers in a second about task completion. So it didn't really seem to even limit them in the task. We've actually since gone to another, some off-board computation to speed it up so we can actually get better video. But it's, it's a good... Uh, pass to say, you know what, even the video imagery doesn't have to be that uh, stitched together to actually, for the users to do a good job. All right, so then the person switches over, they do waypoint control, and they get over to the person of interest, and this is what you're seeing. So we, we put this picture in the back of a shadow box, effectively, to force the user, because we didn't want somebody just to kind of do a flyby and kind of get the picture from the side. We wanted them to be able to navigate because it, caused, it takes some control and to get it right there in front so they could get um, a good image of the picture. I'm going to give you the link, and I, I, I plan to leave my slides with you if you wanted to. And I've got the link to YouTube that gives you all the videos, so if you want to go watch more of these, you can. All right, so 64% um, of the 14 people correctly read the eye chart. Now, what does that mean? All of them found it. But 64, their instructions were to read 
somewhere between lines two and six completely. So 64% actually completed one whole line, um, although all of them were able to read some part of the eye chart or not. The best we got was line six. If you, were, if you went to the doctor's office and you read line six, that would make you 2030 in your eyes. And I see a lot of glasses in the room. I mean, a lot of us would love to have 2030 vision, right? Now, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one comparison with the vehicle since the vehicle is actually closer than the 30 feet that you would be standing back. But again, I think it's a, it's a good testament to the fact that these web-based cams, something cheap, and the system itself was designed such that a person could actually get pretty good visual acuity. Because you can imagine, if you're trying to use this in the real field, if you couldn't actually read anything, if you don't have some ability to have some visual acuity, then they're not really that useful. Now, we did get some blurring, like you see here. But the vehicle would stable out, and you could actually do that. So you could read a street sign, for example, or letters off of a license plate, which for police would actually be something very valuable. Did you think of in interlacing both your video and uh, snapshots? So that you could use that. that. That's a, it's a good question. Um, we, for this particular um, setting, it was beyond the scope of the complexity of the experiment. That's actually been a point of contention inside the military itself. Operators actually, what they, they call it full motion video versus just the snapshots. Operators prefer to actually look at the snapshots. Full motion video is too much for them. It's bouncy. It's hard to track. It's actually, you know, trying to locate yourself and, and, you know, I'm here at these coordinates and I'm looking here and the camera's looking here. It's actually a lot for users. So we've seen that people have typically in the field, they like to look at the, the imagery. Um, as a, but unfortunately, for some things like tracking moving targets, you would need the full motion video. The eye chart, it's the difference between... Oh, sure, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. right. On yeah. Sure, and so one of the other things that, we, that we're not showing here is operationally, we've enabled, there's actually a picture button in there. So, in fact, whenever you get to a place that you, you see something, you say, I want to take a picture, 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 picture. So it's just a button that you hit. You don't see the picture right away, but it, it, it stores files offline for just that kind of thing, for post hoc analysis. So uh, 13 out of 14 found the person of interest, uh, and 12 out of 13 got the person of interest right when they actually looked in the lineup ship photo. So, again, you, know, you can imagine face recognition is something important for you want to, want to be able to do in these kind of technologies, and it was a pretty successful run. So, yes. So in the demo, when they were moving over to the picture, you mentioned that they had switched to waypoint control. How are you doing your waypoint control? Like, how are you getting those coordinates? So in the motion capture room, um, it's, a, it's effectively GPS indoors, right? So you, would, you had a map. They had the map on the iPhone. And, and you knew what the general area was. So you just click, you just put your, laid down your waypoint. And then, you know, that represented an XYZ in, the, in a three-dimensional oh, so frame. The room is doing some sort of, broadcasting some sort of yeah, special that's what, Yeah, the motion capture rooms, that's what they do. They, bas they basically replicate GPS indoors. Um, we'll talk about a little, uh, in a second why motion capture rooms are, they, they can be very good for some of the controls testing here, but in terms of human-on-loop testing, they might not be as great as we would like them to be, and I'll explain why in a second. So best and worst performers, both women, I like to point out, because it turns out that spatial ability does matter, and we actually saw um, a fairly strong correlation with a, a standardized um, spatial abilities psychological test. But women were really great and also really awful in this experiment. So what you're seeing, this young lady, um, pretty much all over the map. She just couldn't, you know, she was having problems both with orienting the vehicle, seeing what she wanted to say. I think she was having problems in her own head, building the mental mo model of where she was looking. And, and that's the telltale signs are a lot of these circular areas and zigzags. And I'm not even sure how she got over off into this side of the room and then had to bring it back, right? And so, um, you know, it's, it, it's a good representation that, you know, in fact, there probably are some people better at this task than others. Not everybody's the same as we might imagine. This was also a young lady, though, and she's just rock solid. This is like the Chuck Yeager of, of micro air vehicle flying. You know, she would waypoint, she would go into nudge control, you know, she finessed it and and, and women are actually the you know, the research is clear, we're better at fine motor control, mostly because we have smaller digits, less distance to travel, you know, you know, there's some reasons behind, but she nailed it. And then what she did was she was supposed to use GPS. She did GPS control to the um, eye chart, but then on the person of interest, so she GPSed it over here, and then as she was, you can see as she was circling around, and this, the little blue is like the field of view of the camera, so she was circling around, she was smart, and she actually saw in the distance, 
Um, now remember, they had no idea what the room, what the layout of the room was like in advance. But she just happened to see the scan, and she's like, aha! So as soon as she read the line of the art, she whipped the vehicle around and just drove it like a truck over to the, um, uh, over to the person of interest, nailed it, and then was done, and she won. All right, so some future work that we're looking at. Um, we're moving to the great outdoors because for a couple of reasons. Um, we're really the research that I'm doing in my lab. We're looking at the shared space between um, uh, humans and these vehicles it means they need to be in some fairly close proximity. And so we would like to be able to close the physical. We'd like to have them in the same distance, so uh, same the same uh, the same area, so we could actually see their interactions. Oh, and let me step back a little bit to remind you why do we care about their interactions? You'll appreciate this. One of the problems that we saw was, you know, first of all, what's the neutral pose for a person holding this? Right? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? You know, we designed it to be, you know, somewhere, it, and it has some some flex in the system from about zero degrees flat to about five degrees up. Women would typically hold the, the um, display like this. Men would typically hold it flat. Not, you know, not every single case, but there was a clear difference between the genders on what they thought the resting pose was. Um, and even so, you know, so, so some people would have a resting pose that would, be a, that would always cause a vehicle to back up a little bit. So they were always fighting their own inclination. So we needed to do a little bit more fine tuning on that. Uh, but at, one of the other things that we saw is if only people would have done it like this. We saw a real problem. We, Really like to hunch over like this, like and say, so, you know. So this is actually you don't want this, right? This is a terrible posture. And then if you've got a pack on your back and guns all over you, you know, you really want to somehow, you know, get people to relax. I don't know if we could have done that with more training. You know, maybe people would relax. But I did find it curious. And if you actually, so I actually catch myself every now and then hunched over my own phone. And I think, hmm, you know, I don't know what we can do about that other than we just recognize that we're hunters when it comes to these technologies. Um, but we need to move it outside because, first of all, these environments, what we've designed it for was to support outside. And the big thing, the big difference outside is wind. So we're actually, we're writing a paper right now. We've done some experiments. We're trying to figure out, again, without having to add any special devices that cause extra weight. And by the way, the weight is critical here. It's even, weight is always critical in the design of any aircraft, but even more importantly on this because weight equals battery life right away, right? And so the battery life is already stretched as it is. So we really want to get the weight down. So how to then do something about the wind? You can't put a little wind sock up on it. In fact, uh, you know, what, what is it that you can do uh, to measure the wind um, to make sure that people, and what, why do you even need to measure the wind? So at first, when we were first conceiving of this, we were going to give people this wind display. The wind is coming out of this direction at these many um, knots or meters per second or whatever you want to, whatever units you wanted. Uh, but that's because, you know, we're thinking like pilots. And pilots don't, these are not pilots, right? These are people with no meteorologic training. No, and even if they did understand, they re really, they're not pilots, so they don't understand, I need to crab into the wind five degrees uh, all the time while I'm flying this. They, first, they don't need to because the ascending technologies control uh, software is excellent. It already crabs into the wind. It knows to crab into the wind, right? So you don't even want somebody to have to have those. So the question is, what, so then if you have novice users, people with virtually no training other than they know how to work their cell phone, how do you alert them to wind? Or why do you alert them and, and what do you do with it? So we settled into a basically a stoplight thresh, a stoplight uh, metaphor. We want to alert them when the vehicle is experiencing gusts that could be a problem. And we definitely, we want to warn them when the vehicle is definitely experiencing a gust that could likely cause it to blow into the building, right? So we're working on that right now of using some position estimation um, to, to keep track of how, it's, how this, um, the automation is actually, how much correction the automation is needing to make to then make some estimations about when. Simply just to warn them, you either need to think about landing or you should land. So that's in the works and we're actually getting ready. To, we're going to replicate that experiment that you just saw outside. We're, we've got street signs and peep cardboard cutouts of people. I don't want, you know, uh, we can't, um, there's these things called institutional review boards, which most of you know about. So we can't have put people in real danger um, out there. Uh, we're also working on um, better visualizations for LIDAR. Uh, you know, looking at a LIDAR, for most of you who've worked in that, that's like trying to find the baby in an ultrasound in that first, you know, you're like, what? What am I looking at? What is, you see something in there, right? So um, I think that LIDAR is such a popular technology across a number of robotic applications. 
we need to help our people understand what they're seeing because if they are really going to do obstacle avoidance in the real world, which they're hopefully going to do, you need to give your user some other clue than a bunch of lines, uh, you know, kind of detach, have a couple of drinks. Remember those pictures where you'd have to unfocus to see the three-dimensional image come out? Who, who remembers those? You've got to be of a certain age to remember that, right? Could you do that? I never could do that. Uh, and like I talked about before, uh, in fact, did anybody see this? This is this this. It looks just like that, only this is, this is even bigger because it's this whole case he wears around his neck. I mean, from a human factors ergonomic standpoint, this thing is a nightmare. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the, the big dog, you know, that, that that's what it takes to maybe control these things right now. But we really do need to move more to our metaphor of the light hand weight controller to do this. Because, again, you don't want, if this is what an army, this is what a controller has to use to use these, you have to ask yourself, is it really worth all that effort? So I've left up my website here. Dave Pittman is the student um, whose uh, work I presented here today. His thesis is up there for you to look at. The, the article, we've written an article on it. It's in review for human-computer interaction, but you know, I'll die before I get the reviews back because it takes so long. Um, and then the YouTube videos are up there. So with that, any questions? Oh, I'm sorry I went a little long. I didn't really. Uh, Late, really uh, I was going to ask a, a question. Having, having been a pilot, did you, have you, have you flown um, a, a predator-type vehicle from, from one of those from one of those huts? Not a real one, but yeah, I've flown lots of simulated ones. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I, I, I'm just wondering about the difference in you, you get so much extra input as the pilot in the vehicle that you don't get mm -hmm. sat in a room looking mm -hmm. at a flat mm -hmm. display. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny that you say that because actually one of the things that the one of the very first th things that you learn as a real pilot is to not trust your senses. Um, because weather horizons can be false, so you, that's why they, that's why instrument training is so critical, right? Because all instrument training is there to do is to tell you not to trust what you're seeing, and even feeling. Um, if you have an inner ear infection, you can feel like you're leaning when you're not really leaning. Um, so there are some problems, you know, even proprioception that you think might be really useful in the cockpit. The seat of the pants flying that we talk about, you know, it's, it, it can be helpful in some situations, but particularly in bad weather or places where there can be visual illusions, which, you know, any kind of low uh, operations where you're trying to do any low bombing, strafing missions, you, you need to not rely as much on your senses as you would think you would. So, so there is, the, but, but one of the things that we see is we see people trying to replicate in the ground control stations of the future, we want to replicate the pilot experience, which is actually the wrong approach because you don't, the, the thing that the pilot has in situ that you don't have as a, a UAV operator is the ability to look around, right? That's the most powerful thing. You know, you get to this much better, you can see around, you can see down, you can look around, and you can see other planes that you might be flying with. So, but an unmanned vehicle, you don't need to look around. There's actually not a lot to see. Um, when you're at 30,000 feet, there's actually not a lot going on up there. Uh, and so what you really, your, your head's in the cockpit. When you're doing bombing missions for real, high altitude, your head is totally down all the time in displays. And in fact, the displays you can get it, you know, in the flat screen in the big world are far better than you can get in, this goes back to your technology. You know, they're still working with CRT monitors technology in real fighter aircraft, right? So it'll be a long time before the, the new LCD technology catches up. So I think the like the quadcopter technology is like super cool, and I've been like really excited to see a lot of this stuff uh, recently. Um, I've been kind of poking around at, at uh, a, a lot of it recently, and I found that the kind of underlying technology that enables it is not like super new or super high tech in terms of just getting the these things up off the ground and, off, and running. Um, so I was just kind of curious from your end if you know like why it's like we're, we're seeing a lot of this stuff around these, these devices now in, in 2010 as opposed to maybe like 15 years ago or something when you could imagine that the technology could have just been ready. Now, I, I must admit, I'm very ignorant about the development of technology, so mm -hmm. maybe like the type of onboard accelerometers or gyroscopes mm -hmm. have only recently become mm -hmm. more practical. I think um, it's all of that. I think, first of all, I mean, the, the automated control technology in the Airbus has actually been around a fairly long time. But the engineering and the sensors that go along with that, I mean, these are things that were not commercially available off the, ma off the market. Computational power, um, you know, the... Um, 
batteries. batteries. I mean, it's, it's kind of been the, the uh, coalescence of all of those things that, that computationally wise, the, we can get the weight down and the batteries have come down and the control technology, you know, for the, for the aircraft, I mean, that's been around for a while. But, it, you know, getting everybody, actually, as those of you who work in the real, you know, I mean, system integrators, it's actually not easy to bring all these different pieces together to come around. So it's not surprising, um, but it, what the, I think to me it's really encouraging because we're going to see huge, huge growth in this, in, um, in this area. Because uh, as, soon as, you, as soon as the FAA comes around, you know, we're all, the only, in, fact, in fact, there's nothing stopping you from, we can give you our app right now, and you can go spend $4,500, and you're off and running. And there was a, you know, a, a, somebody from another company who will remain nameless. I showed them this technology, and the first thing that the guy said was, I could follow my wife around with that thing. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> you could, among a lot of other things. In fact, I know, you know, what I were, on a daily basis, I am checking outside my window because I know my students. They are trying really hard. <laughs> They don't think I know this, but they are trying really hard to send, because the lab is actually in a building, not, not in my building. So they're trying to send the quad rotor out to hang outside my window and spy on me. I know they are. And the only reason they haven't done it is because I keep them really busy. So that's the other thing. You've got to keep these people busy or they're going to be spying on you and using these technologies for evil. Um, and then just kind of a follow-up on that, um, what, what are the companies that, I, I imagine there have to be some, that are actively trying to get this technology more integrated in the military because th that seems like a huge profit opportunity for them because like these devices you you know you see in your video are are actually incredibly stable and um, that it they're relatively cheap to build um, and especially if you were to do it on mass mm -hmm. and like you you just mm -hmm. have lots of these things like mm -hmm. it, it seems like a great opportunity so what are the companies that are like going after this. Um, well, uh, let me think, you know, um, Helen Grainer, formerly of iRobot, is, she's going into the UAV for commercial purpose, small UAV commercial purposes. She's the only one that I know that's actually doing that, that area of development. And, you know, you can ask yourself, well, it just, it hasn't caught on quite yet in terms of, you know, companies, there's, a, but there are a lot of little companies out there that are actually building a lot of these Dragonfly, Raven, these types of things for the military. So that, that actually is, there's a, you know, you go on the internet and you say, you know, small UAV company and you, you'll get a ton of hits. I actually tell you the, the real thing that I find depressing and, you know, if tenure doesn't work out for me at MIT, I'm going to go start my own company because nobody is doing the interfaces for these things. And this is why this kind of research is, you know, hopefully catches on and, and people understand. And this is why I come to places like Microsoft. Because I'm giving you guys a big present here. You know, nobody is doing enough work in this area of how to miniaturize these display technologies for real. Even Parrot, you know, I mean, you know, they've got a toy and it's a fun toy, but, you know, they're not human. They're nobody's, nobody's doing the display work and, that, and it shows. Uh, but, you know, it's a game, right? But that's a, and that's a different world. So we need to get people on board with, you know, and get rid of that, right? And get it down to something that's actually practically useful because that's actually a big uh, a, a big obstacle to actually seeing these com these technologies take off more commercially. Well, let's thank the, oh, thank the speaker for this. You can come up afterwards yes. and ask me.